Many people think cyberbullying is commonplace. Students in New Jersey reported a perceived bullying rate of 42%, when in reality the rate was only 9%. Why did they think the rate was so high? Did one student see teasing and another see bullying? What did the adults see? To help us reach a common understanding of cyberbullying, let's start with a definition accepted by most experts. I would define bullying as a behavior that's intended to cause harm, that's either repetitive or pervasive, and that has, uh, that's not accidental, um, and that indeed has an impact, a negative impact on others. So the difference between bullying and cyberbullying in my mind is that bullying is more apt to be persistent. It keeps going. The same thing happens day after day, week after week. Cyberbullying can happen one time and then become pervasive. It happens once, but it gets spread all over the internet or the Twitterverse or whatever. And so it has a huge impact, even though it was maybe only stated one time. But is that really how students see it? Certainly there are kids who do experience um, what they would call, what the, the teen would term cyberbullying. But there's a whole other phenomenon out there that we also try to measure in our research, which um, we call meanness and cruelty, some other people call drama. Um, it's a term that teens apply to their experiences online. It's important to understand the difference between drama, conflict, and bullying. Drama and even conflict have an element of consent to them. Bullying is different in that there is a power differential. One party is not agreeing to be a part of this. We found that a lot of teens had at least witnessed drama and this meanness and cruelty uh, in social media spaces. We really need to let the students' experience of the event help us define our reaction to the event. Whether we call it drama, meanness, or bullying, how can we help students recognize and take charge in addressing the issue? When they're sitting in front of a computer or they're sitting in front of their mobile phone and they're texting and they're chatting with somebody, there's this real break because they don't see the connection to the human being on the other side. So a lot of the discussion that we talk about is who is that other being on the other side? How are they reacting to the information that you're placing out there? Why would they be hurt by the comments that you make? Why would they feel like they're coming into a building now where they're not safe? Because when we look at bullying, we don't just look at the victim and the bully, we're also looking at the bystander. Most teens say that they stand up and try to intervene on behalf of the person who is in some ways the victim in a situation, and that they also see other people standing up. Our high school has a bullying prevention club that's been very successful. There are a number of elements that have helped to make it successful. First of all, it was student-initiated. They wanted to start the club. They came to the administration about starting this club. The other thing is it's student-led, student-directed. We're not in there telling them how to do it. They're telling us what they're going to do. It's important to remember that even though the internet can amplify the negative effects of bullying, it can also do a lot of good. There are a lot of student-made initiatives that have been put out through social media that have helped other students, that have created positive change, that have made our world more civil, more kind, more mutually respectful. So as adults, it's important for us to understand the differences between a hurtful use of the tool and a helpful use of the tool and to help students understand the difference as well.